Well, we want to thank each one of you for coming out today. And of course, today is the first day our nursery is open, so we finally was able to get our certificate of occupancy, and that's a and it won't be long. I am believing and praying that by next month, November, sometime in November, we'll be able to have a true Thanksgiving service next door with the construction all done. That is our hope and prayer. It's been a good project, and for the most part, things have gone really, really well, and so we're very thankful for that. So that's something we want to be praying about. I want to just mention very quickly while you're turning in your Bibles to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Uh, the, there will be a, a business meeting that is going to be scheduled. Uh, it is scheduled for the 25th. So we have several things that we're going to be presenting to you. One will be about the building. One will be about some of the uh, next year's office officers that you can look at. And so the budget, there's going to be a lot of things presented on the 25th. And that'll be right after church. So just plan on the 25th of this month just to look at some very important documents and things that uh, are going to be presented to you, laid out for your approval. And that is on October 25th. And we appreciate your presence for that. You know, today I'm talking about the subject of distress. You know, we all go through times of stress and distress. We all go through times where we have to deal with it, and we all have to have these, these moments, it seems like, where it, it seems like life just kind of starts to close in. Well, I look at David's life, and I see here is a man who, if he ever had to deal with stress, this man had it in spades, bushel bucket loads of it. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, this is just one page out of David's life that was filled at times with conflict and stress and how he dealt with it. You'll notice what it says here in this story. It says, and the men in the army were sad and angry because their sons and daughters were taken prisoner. Now, this is when Ziklag was captured by the Amalekites. David is on the run from Saul. He has about 600 men who have come out into the wilderness to join in his efforts. And uh, they left their women and children and all of their goods at Ziklag while they went out and did some recon. While they were out reconning, well, the Amalekites came and just took everything. So David has lost everything. He's lost his wives. He's lost his children. He's lost all of his worldly possessions. The only thing he has is what he has on his back, what he could carry with him. And the 600 men who followed him, well, they lost everything too. It's a sad time. It's a distressing time. It's a time of tremendous stress. And not only that, but the men who were so heartbroken over their loss and this is kind of like how we are as humans, isn't it? When bad things happen, we begin to look around and try to find someone to blame. Someone we can point a finger at and say, hey, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be in this situation. Or because you did this or that or whatever, I had to go through this kind of pain. Well, this is where it is now. There is talk. David is not only hearing the sobs, and the sighs, but he's also hearing the whispers. Maybe we need a new leader. Maybe it's time to get rid of David. Maybe we just need to take this <clears throat> guy out and stone him. <clears throat> now David, he could have done several things at that point. He could have run away, tried to hide so he wouldn't get himself killed. He could have gotten angry at God, and usually in times of loss, anger is a part of that process, and we tend to want to get mad, and generally it usually comes back to God. We usually get angry at God, and he could have done that. And There were a lot of emotional feelings he was going through, and all of that could have clouded his judgment, but David did something very significant. 
It says this upsaved David very much, but he found strength in the Lord his God. He encouraged himself, one version says, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He found courage in the presence of the Lord. Now this is the key part I want you to get this morning, is courage is found in the presence of the Lord. And we all go through times of distress, and we all go through lots of stress. And there are moments when we just feel like that, wow, we don't know that we can take, take it anymore. And sometimes the stress is because of our choices. Sometimes the stress is because of other people's choices. I remember reading a kind of humorous story about three little old ladies who were traveling down a highway and they were pulled over by a police officer and uh, he pulled them over and he said do you know why I pulled you over and the little old lady driving she looked at him and said no sir I really don't and he says well the speed limit on this road is 55 you were going 20 she said no sir I was going the speed limit he says no ma'am you're going 20 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour speed zone. She said, officer, look at that sign right there. It says 20. He says, ma'am, that's State Highway 20. <laughs> and he says, I'll let you off with a warning, but learn the difference between a speed limit sign and a state road sign. And he noticed that the little old lady in the back seat was just in all kinds of distress and she was just struggling and and she was trying to catch her breath and she was just and he looked back there and he said ma'am are you okay and the other little old lady on the other side in the front seat said oh she's all right said we just got off state road 85 <laughs> so sometimes our stress is our fault, and sometimes it's the fault of somebody else, that's for sure. And David was going through a tremendous amount of stress. I began to look at David's life, and I just started jotting down all the stress points he had. And you know, everything you do has stress points, and some have a lot more stress points than others. And psychologists have worked out a, a grid with stress points on it, you know, uh, moving has so many stress points, divorce has so many stress points, a death in the family has so many stress points, and they rank it. And uh, if you have over so many stress points a year, the likelihood of you having a, an illness as a result of it goes up exponentially and all this sort of thing. So I got to look at it in David's life, and I thought about this. Think about what he went through, the stress, the rejection, the sorrow, when I started jotting it down, I thought, man, this is amazing. First of all, you remember he felt the rejection of his father because when the prophet Samuel came to anoint the next king, David's father brought out all of his sons, except for David. And Samuel looked at each one of them and said, mm, no, mm, no, mm, no. Is this all you got? And David's father said, yeah, I got a little guy, one left. He's out tending sheep. You see, his father did not see kingly material in David. He did not see in David his potential. He could not see in his own son what God saw in his own son. So in a sense, David started off being, yeah, the little guy, the run of the litter, the fellow who was not really looked at as possessing kingly material. And if that wasn't enough, his dad finally sent him one day to take some happy meals to his brothers who were out on the front line fighting the Philistines. And you remember the story of Goliath. And he went to fight Goliath. But when his brothers found out that he was going to go fight Goliath, they mocked him and made fun of him. So there was again that rejection. He's going out in the name of the Lord and his older brothers are mocking him. 
You know, some people just don't have spiritual perception. They may be in church, but they don't have spiritual perception. They may be around the people of God, but they don't feel what the people of God feel. They may be hearing the music, but they're not feeling the music. They may be seeing the praise, but don't feel like praising. And they don't really understand why some people really are into it and desire the presence of God when they're content just to watch the show, as they think of it. And so the brothers were rejecting their little brother again. And then David, he says, hey, y'all do your own thing. What do I have to do with what you're doing anyway? This is between me and God. This is between myself and my God. And he goes out and kills Goliath. And then you'll remember, he, of course, kind of becomes instant hero. He's promoted up to the palace. And as the palace, as he's in the palace, he's called upon to be the musician, and he's singing and playing and doing all these things, glorifying God. King Saul, the king he's serving, looks at him and is jealous of him. He's hearing the songs on the top ten list, and at number one is Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. That doesn't go over well in the palace. That's a song he doesn't want to hear. It creates jealousy because Saul is a really, really very insecure man. Jealousy is always rooted in insecurity. And he becomes so insecure and so paranoid that he begins to throw javelins at David. And David just barely misses a time or two getting pinned to the wall. So David, being the smart kid he is, he says, you know, I think I need to leave. Hint, hint. Time to go. And he leaves. Talk about rejection again. And he leaves. And of course, he's out in the wilderness trying to hide from King Saul. 600 men come out to be kind of uh, a resistance movement, if you please, with David. But then we have the story at Ziklag, which we just read to you. And even they want to stone him. So later on, you remember how David's life kind of comes about and, and uh, he's thinking, okay, maybe he can return or whatever. And he's thinking, um, I can marry the king's daughter. Because we all know marriage solves everything, doesn't it? I mean, that'll take care of all my problems. And he marries Saul's daughter. Well, guess what? She rejects him. She makes fun of him publicly. She despises him, the Bible says. Okay, then he's got children. And then he's got all these kids running around. And one of his kids, one of his sons, defiles one of his daughters. And if that wasn't bad enough... Her brother, on the other side, decided this cannot stand. And he says to his dad, are you going to do anything about this? And David basically does nothing about it. And Absalom says, no, this is no good. This isn't justice. And in two years, he plots his vengeance. And one night, he kills him. So now David has this dysfunctional family life going on. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, the same Absalom who killed his other son for his defilement of Tamar, he decides to lead a coup against his dad and have his dad assassinated so he can take over the throne. Talk about rejection. And David has to flee. And so one night he goes down through the Kidron Valley, which is known as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And he's trying to sneak out of town because Absalom, his son, is hunting for him, trying to kill him. 
I got to thinking about this. He's rejected by his father. He's rejected by his brothers. He's rejected by his king. He's rejected by his wife. He's rejected by his son. He's rejected now in this story by 600 of his good men who follow him. He has a boatload of rejection. Talk about stress and distress. How many of you know what it feels like to be rejected? To be thought of as less than. Maybe you got let go from your job. There's a sense of feeling of rejection. Maybe you went through a divorce. There's that painful rejection. Maybe you've uh, had a son or daughter who just said, fully on your values, fully on your church, fully on your God, I'm out of here. There's that sense of rejection. Maybe a spouse has said, I hate your guts. Just get out of my sight. Rejection. David went through about every kind of rejection, distress you could go through. I got to thinking about it. No wonder he died at 70. He had enough stress points to kill a dozen people. And I thought, God, what's the answer? What's the answer to this? And the Bible says that David, David encouraged himself in the Lord. How? The first thing he did was he consulted the Lord. How did he encourage himself in the Lord? First of all, he realized that God was for him and not against him. Now, I want to tell you something. When everything's falling apart, you're losing your job, you're losing your marriage, you're losing your family, you're losing your health, it's very easy to think that God is not for me. He absolutely must be against me. He's probably ripped at me about something. What did I do to tick God off this bad? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. You see, we live in a fallen world, don't we? We live behind enemy lines. The assaults are continual, and they will be until you step down on streets of gold. When you hear, as Gary sang for us, your races run, your home. But until then, we are in a continual assault of one form or another. And death stalks us all. My thought about this was I believe that David was suffering from what we would call today PTSD. PTSD, it's a terrible thing. It causes you to make a lot of bad decisions because you're, you're trying to find a lot of healing. And we find that people who suffer post-traumatic stress disorder, you don't have to be a combat vet to suffer this. Any kind of prolonged, repeated trauma will bring you into that kind of a mental state. And it leaves you feeling helpless and hopeless. Psychologists have a term called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness. What do we mean by learned helplessness? Let me illustrate that by, by telling you the story about how they train elephants in India. They take an elephant when he's small, and they tie him with a chain to a post in the ground that's in concrete. And as hard as that elephant tries, he cannot get away. Every time he tugs against the chain, that post in the ground and concrete is not going to let him leave. And as he grows older, and he has hundreds of times tried to get away from that chain and that stake in the ground, he finally gives up. He quits. He says, I can't do it. It's impossible. You see, he has learned helplessness. Now what happens is that later on, as big and mighty as he is, all they have to do when he gets past that learned helplessness stage is that they can just tie just a simple rope and just drive a stick in the ground, and this big elephant could just run off. 
But when he feels that little tug still on his leg, he stops. Why? Because he has learned helplessness. He believes that he cannot. And so he quits. He quits. He gives up. He gave up a long time ago. Now it doesn't take concrete and stakes and chains, just rope and a stick in the ground. That'll hold him. And I just sometimes think that somehow the enemy has so beat us up to where that we give up. And we're so knocked down that we don't think about coming back anymore. Let me give you an example of one more study, though, but I, I want you to get a hold of it. This was something that about that really... It talks about the power of hope. The power of hope. Scientists took some rats, put them in a tank of water, and they just were checking to see how long these rats would stay in the water, this tank of water. And they swam and swam for about 10 minutes and drowned. Now, I know that's cruel and all the rest, so get past that. I'm trying to make a point here. So they took two more rats, put them in a tank of water, and about nine and a half minutes, they saw these rats were starting to panic, like the others. But instead of letting them drown, they reached in, pulled the rats out, dried them off, gave them some food, warmed them up. And then, an hour later, they put them back in the tank. This time, the rats went 18 minutes before they started to panic. And then when they started to panic, thought they were going to drown, Scientists would reach in, pick them up, dry them off, give them some food, let them rest a while, and then they would do it again. You see, they found out that rats who were conditioned this way could go 37 hours swimming because they knew that before they reached the end, a hand would reach down and pull them up and take care of them, dry them off, comfort them, feed them, warm them up. They had this hope because it had happened in the past, it would happen again in the future. Hope allowed them to go way beyond what they could have got done on their own. You see the power of hope, the power of hope. The thing that I want to say this morning is that we have a hope undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved for us in heaven. We have a hope because there was one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have a hope because there's one who said, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Today we have a hope because there was one who told us that we could do all things through Christ who strengthened us. Today we have a hope because we have God's Spirit living in us, God's promises with us, and God's direction for us. It is a hope that cannot be shaken, and no matter how bad it gets, we know that before we sink, there's going to be a hand reach down, pick us up, love us, and say, keep on going, I'm with you. The power of hope. So if you can learn hopelessness and helplessness as the elephant, we ought to be able to learn the power of hope. That optimism and hope is something else that we can We call it faith. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith does not usually start off in mountain-moving form. It starts off very small in our lives. 
But as we grow and we exercise it and we see what God can do and what he does do, our hope grows. It's the power of a little bit of hope. Some of you today need some hope. You need some hope because your finances are running thin. You need some hope because someone you love is sick. You need some hope today because one of your children is lost out in the world in destructive habits. Some of you need some hope today because life for you and, and your family and your marriage, it seems to be threadbare and coming apart at the seams. I want you to know our God is the God of hope. And if he saved you before, he'll save you again. If he's provided for you before, he'll provide for you again. That's our God. Well, the federal government did a study. They spent 145 million taxpayer dollars on this study. Nothing the government ever does is cheap. We all know that. And they did this study on how to help people, especially their military, who came back from the battlefield with PTSD. I had a, I had a member of my church. Him and his family were members of our church out there at Fort Knox. He'd come back from Iraq. He'd been deployed more than once, and he was suffering PTSD and it was, it was so evident, and I worked with him and worked with him. He wrote a book later called The Marm Heart, and it comes back from the 3rd Infantry Division battle back in World War I in the Marm, and it's called The Soldier's Heart, it's called Shell Shock, it's called a lot of different names over the years, but now we have titled it PTSD. And I counseled with him. I loved on him. We gave him the word of God. We saw him turn his life over to the Lord. We saw his wife and kids really get involved in the church. And uh, we were working so hard with him. But it was a struggle for him, struggle for him to get beyond all the things that he saw and <sighs> Unfortunately, he told me a lot of things that he did. And he could not get beyond it, and he could not forgive himself. And, he, and it, was, it was pretty horrific. And I remember one Wednesday night, I got a frantic call. It was right after church, and it was his wife. And uh, she said, Pastor, Pastor, come out to the parking lot right away. She called his name. She said, he's having a meltdown. He is losing it big time. I dropped everything. I ran out of the church. I ran to the parking lot, and I saw the family. And this soldier was literally losing it. I mean, in every sense of the word, he was losing it. wife was crying, the kids were crying, and I walked up to him, and he looked at me, and I just looked at him, and I said, God, what do I say to this man? And the only thing I knew to do, my heart broke for him in that moment, and I just took my arms around this big soldier, I wrapped them around him, and I just cried with him. I never said a word. I just held him. And as I was holding him, praying for him in my soul, and we were just standing there together, I felt the hand of God touch him and the tension, the tension. I could just feel him relax. I could just feel him give way. You see, the Bible says the thief has come to kill, steal, and what? Destroy. And here was one of our finest, bravest, 
but he was being destroyed. I still, every once in a while, get a call from or a text from his family telling me how he's doing. He has become a, he went way out west, state of Washington. He got out of the army and became a park ranger. <laughs> so he's out in the woods a lot, which is a good place for him. Because if you put him in an office with a lot of little cubicles, somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> so he needs to be out there to where he can just be alone. And he's doing well now. And he wrote a lot of great things in his book that I, I appreciated. But you know, the thing that is bringing healing to him, the thing that helped him, was some of the things I just want to share with you real quick. And it's all about the power of hope. But the government spent $145 million on this, and they came up with five things. And I thought... Goodness, you spent $145 million on something the Bible already tells us about. But you know how that goes. So I'm going to give you these five things. This big scientific study that they did on trying to help our soldiers is called PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. And you know how the military is. They, everything's in an acrostic, so each one of these letters stands for something. And I'm just going to give them to you real quickly, but I want you to know that there is such powerful spiritual truth here. The first one we have is the P. And this is how you come back from a setback. Okay? All of us have had setbacks. But God's plan for us is that we all come back from a setback. Okay? And that's the whole thing. When you've been knocked back, it's a setup for a comeback. And that's what I want to say. The first one is P in the PERMA, and it means that we have what they call, what they call positive emotions. This is a secular term, positive emotions. But for me, it's the joy of the Lord. How many of you can think of anything more positive than the joy of the Lord? Knowing that God is for you, not against you. Knowing that he loves you unconditionally. Knowing that he has a plan for your life and a future. That he has given you a destiny. He's not finished with you. And that whatever has come upon you is not de designed to destroy you. But God is going to see to it that what the enemy has meant for evil, he is going to bring good out of that. And you are ultimately going to glorify God and fulfill your destiny. That's God. It is the joy of the Lord. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my what? Tell me. My strength. You see, the problem is with people who are suffering all the stress and distress is they lose strength. I've met people who struggle with depression. They just don't have any strength. They'll get them and go. But the moment you mention something that really they find a great deal of joy in. Hey, let's go fishing. Hey, let's go play golf. Somewhere, strength comes back. Just moping around, man, I just don't feel like money. Let's go fishing. Oh, wow. You see, the joy of fishing is their strength. Well, for you and for me, the joy of the Lord, knowing that God is there with me, loving me, not rejecting me. See, that's the P. Positive emotion. No, it's the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah 8.10. I love this verse. Nehemiah 8.10. Then he told them. He's talking about how the people were so downhearted over the situation in Jerusalem. Walls are down. People are discouraged. They have just, in every sense of the word, given up. And here's the message. Go eat rich foods. Now, I like that verse right there. I tell you what. If I need a scripture verse, I just found it right here. Nehemiah 8.10. Go eat rich foods and drink sweet drinks. And send portions of those who cannot provide for themselves... For today is a holy day for the Lord. 
Don't be sad because the joy you have in the Lord is your strength. Don't be sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so that's the P. Psalm 16 says, He shows me the path of life, and at his right hand, in his presence, is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jeremiah 15 says, He sent his word to me, and it was a rejoicing in my heart, for I am called by his name. Listen, folks, if you don't have anything else to rejoice about in this world, if you are called by his name... If you are saved and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, you have so much to just stand up and say, I want to praise God because heaven is my home. This is temporary down here. I'm going to leave all this behind. Heaven awaits. Number two, the second thing is engagement. They call it engagement, but I call it the presence of the Lord. Engagement. In other words, they want you to engage with life, engage with someone. They want you to uh, just get in a positive place, engage in a positive place. Listen, for me, this was easy to figure out because for me, I believe that God wants us to enjoy His presence, engage with Him, get in His presence. Get in his presence. Moses said something interesting. I was uh, reading about what Moses said in Exodus chapter 33, verses 13 through 15. Moses said something to God when God told him that you're going to be doing something very big and very special, and it'll be very difficult. Moses said this, Now therefore, I pray if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know you that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And God said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Whenever you start getting stirred up by fear and anxiety, remember, God is there. You feel lonely, God is there. You feel abandoned, God is there. You feel rejected, God is there. My presence is with you. And the result of that was peace, knowing that God is there. And so maybe today some of you will begin to see a breakthrough in your life. The third thing was the R. The R stands for relationships relationships but I consider that relationship is that when we gather together for worship and we work together for common cause and pushing the kingdom of God forward we cannot isolate listen the enemy wants to isolate you God is wanting you to unite with your brothers and sisters forsake not Hebrews eleven twenty five. 25 the assembling of yourselves together why because when we come together there is power and presence. There is healing and presence. There is joy in presence. There is strength in presence. And so we need to come together in relationships. These relationships are critical to the healing. The Bible says one person can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. Do you see the power? of the exponential presence. One a thousand, two ten thousand. Not one a thousand, two two thousand, but one a thousand, two ten thousand. You see, the power of presence is exponential. Listen, how many we have here this morning? I don't know, two or three hundred. But the point of it is, when we gather in His name, the power of presence is exponential. And so there is the importance of coming together. You're not going to get in here what you're going to find in a fishing boat or on a golf cart. Why? Because it is the power of presence. And we 
each one bring our giftedness. We bring the Holy Spirit that is in us together. We come and God promises that when you're gathered in my name, there I will be with you in your presence, in presence, in your midst. So it's important that we understand there is power in presence and the more we have, the more exponential that power is. The devil always looks to divide us, but God always looks to unite us. The M stands for mission. In other words, you've got to have something bigger than you to be engaged in. You see, the problem is people with PTSD isolate themselves and they feel like they have no purpose. They feel like there's nothing, nothing for them to do, nothing they can do. They've lost their mission and purpose. But you see, for us, we have a mission. We have a call on our lives. Every single one of you here today, God has put his call on your life. You are not a purposeless person. Let me repeat that. There is no such thing as a purposeless person. God is for you. He has a plan. He has a mission. And you need a mission. God said, I know the plans that I have for you, plans of good and not evil, to give you a hope and a future. You see, you've got a mission. And I know that COVID seems to have put a kink in our plans, but it has not changed the mission. What happens in the moment never changes the mission. And what God has for us has not been altered because of a pandemic. God has, years ago, he has weaven, he has weaved the pandemic into the plan. Look for it. And so this is God's mission for us. And the last one as we close, the A stands for accomplishments. You've got to have some wins. You've got to have a victory every once in a while. When you get hit and hit and hit and hit, you need to feel like you've got a few wins in the win column. You've got to feel like that you have got some value, you have done some good. And sometimes we think that ought to be something big. But Jesus said to us in Matthew, he said, I want to tell you something, that if you give a cup of cold water to one of my least disciples I want you to know I am going to honor that in your life I am going to give you a reward for something as small as helping encourage one of my least disciples listen folks what we think are little things on earth are big things in heaven and we need to understand that every day we can get involved in some wins. But the key to that is take the focus off of yourself long enough to focus on others. I will say this, and you know this, but when a person is down, 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 defeated, distressed, as long as they keep focusing on themselves, they will not heal. Healing begins emotionally. Spiritually, healing begins when you get your eyes off of your situation and you begin to look around you and say, who can I help? As long as you're begging for help, you're not healing. But when you're giving help, it's an amazing thing how the gift of helping brings back to you the gift of healing. That's the way God intended for it to be. He designed that into the mechanism of life. So, you need a mission? Folks, there are bazillion missions. Even in our own county, there are missions. In this church, there are missions. There is so many places screaming for help. And the way to get beyond a lot of the personal pain is to try to alleviate that pain in someone else. 
The Bible said we are more than conquerors in Romans 8, 37. What does that mean, more than conquerors? That means if we're in a mess and we're just fighting out of addictions, we're fighting out of the morass of all the pain that we're in and the stuff and the choices we've made. But in Christ, we are brought out of that. We are given this new life. Satan has been defeated. Death cannot hold us. We belong to another. We've conquered through Christ. But you know what? We're more than conquerors. Why? Because we're going to go right back and grab somebody else and we're going to help bring them out of there too with the love of Christ. So we are conquerors in Christ, but we're more than conquerors because we're going right back in and we're going to grab this one and we're going to grab that one and we're going to tell them about the love of Jesus and we're going to pull them out of that. We're more than conquerors because we've made it more than just about us. We've made it about rescuing others. We've been given a mission. Go ye into all the world and what? Make disciples. That's healing, is having a divine purpose and a divine mission. And you have that. You just need to uncover it, find it, embrace it, and run with it. God bless. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that today we are more than conquerors. We've been rescued by the love of Jesus. We've been rescued by the cross. We have a message that is a kingdom message. And that, Father, we can be more than conquerors because we can go forth and bring others to healing as well. Father, I pray as we sing this invitation hymn in the closing moments of our service today that you will see hearts as they really are. I know you do. But you'll help people to see their hearts as they really are. Let them know you're here today to bring a healing, to bring them out of the distress, to give them purpose and meaning. And the cross of Jesus Christ is where it starts. For we ask it in his lovely, lovely name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand if we would please. and. I know that as we sing today and as we are dealing with the COVID thing, but today may be a day of prayer, restoration, and healing for you. You can do that right where you stand, but you know, it might be that you just want to come and pray and we'll distance ourselves out all along the front. But do eternal business with God today. Don't put it off.